wonderful. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for attending our uh, very first Ask the Expert session. So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm uh, Terry Thorson. I work for Spinal Cord Injury BC as one of the coordinators and uh, I'll be hosting this session today. Um, first off, I'd like to sincerely thank the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation for providing Dr. Andre Krasiakoff in partnership with SEIBC this grant that will connect our community to health professionals through this series of Ask the S Expert sessions over the coming weeks. Um, so this is your chance to be able to ask health specialists and others questions about COVID-19 and SCI. As part of this grant, we're also working with Dr. K to identify high-risk people with SCI in need of supplies and home cleaning services. Uh, we're currently working with medical suppliers, government and others to source supplies right now, but please contact any one of us uh, staff members at SCIBC if you feel like you're in need of this service. So today um, running the show besides myself is Jocelyn, uh, who is our manager of the Resource Center and Information Services. She's manning the chat and the mute button, all right? You can also raise your hand at that time, which is uh, an option if you click on participants um, and there'll be an option to raise your hand if you have a question, you can click on that as well. Um, also, Jenna, our events lead is here today who can help with any technical issues that you might have. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Andre Krasiakoff. He is a cl clinician, researcher, devoted to helping people with spinal cord injury maintain their cardiac, cardiovascular health mostly. Dr. K is the Associate Director of Rehabilitation Research for i -Cord. He is also the professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of BC. He's a, a physician in the uh, spinal cord program at Vancouver Coastal Health, GF Strong Rehab. That's Lots of us know him. Uh, he obtained his MD from Volgograd, is that right? Yes, State correct. Medical School in Russia, and his PhD from Ivan Pavlov Institute of Physiology in the Russian Academy of Science, St. Petersburg, Russia. And he is also the current president of the American Spinal Cord Injury Association. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. K, for um, being here and our first guest. Thank you. Thank you very much for introduction. And I again also would like to echo a great thank you to colleagues from Craig Nielsen Foundation, which is one of the largest foundation in North America that support research and support individuals with spinal cord injury for their generous grant, which they created during this very difficult period for both for people with spinal cord injury, for clinicians who dealing with patients with COVID uh, infection. And we hope that these sessions will help everybody in BC community to find the answers that they're seeking, to find help that and directions that we can provide as experts during this very, very challenging time. That's a result for the ado, COVID, what I would like to talk with you today. I will outline some major aspects, what we do know at the present time about COVID pandemic around the world. I will specifically outline issue what we learn from the experience in China, in Italy, in United States, in Spain, and the countries which are significant, significant impact of COVID virus. What are the risk groups in general population? I will specifically try to address issues how COVID infection could affect people with spinal cord injury. I will already state that unfortunately we have a very little knowledge about the COVID impact on people with spinal cord injury, but still our general understanding of this disease and infection provide us some at least understanding what can happen and then I will obviously will try to address questions which some of you already sent to SCIBC 
and some of the questions I will answer at the end of my presentation. So the first of all, let's talk on the present issues with pandemics. Pandemics coming from the Greek word, which is a big infection affecting huge amount of people around the world. And unfortunately, human society knows pandemics very well. On this slide, I listed the latest seven pandemics that affected humanity, and some of them were extremely devastating. Some of these conditions, like smallpox, is a viral infection. Malaria is not a virus. HIV AIDS is a virus infection. Cholera is a bacteria. That's why various infection could affect the people. There are difference, obviously, in microorganisms that cause these infections. There are differences in a way of transmission of this disease. For example, cholera, it is still an issue in some parts of our world because of the lack of clean water, because cholera predominantly enters the human body through the oral consumption of food or not purified water, water and this is a problem. COVID virus is totally different issues. This slide showing what is actually data today on the Canadian um, Center of Disease Control and the world situation with respect of uh, diagnosed cases, individuals who unfortunately passed away, and individuals who recovered. As you can see through the data through the British Columbia, through the Canada and whole, and around the world, that's around the world, it's almost quarter million people, unfortunately, already passed away from this infection and we're still counting and counting up. This is interesting diagram. I thought I will show where we in BC standing with respect of number of cases, individuals who passed away. And this is a diagram showing number of deaths per million residents in a specific city or specific region. As you can see, United States and New York is on the top of this diagram. In the British Columbia, we're doing quite well, but it's still we lost almost 100 people at the present time from this infection. As you can see, it is approximately 19 cases per million at the present time, estimated rate of deaths from COVID-19 viral infection. So, so what is the groups uh, presently identified who are at risk? And this is, uh, first of all, how we know what is this infection, how it is transmitted. We do know that it is a viral infection. Virus is infected our nasal throat cavities and then can spread to the lungs. The primary way how infection can be spread, it's through, the, through respiratory droplets generated through the cough or sneeze. It can be also transferred through the prolonged personal contact, such as touching, shaking hands, kissing, hugging. And obviously, person-to-person -person contact is a very crucial was from the beginning for our understanding how we can prevent the spread of this infection. As I mentioned to you previously, different infections has different ways to spread. If we know how they spread, we can develop appropriate measures to prevent spreading and then obviously to fight this infection. Uh, it was very clearly identified from the last three, four months of being in COVID pandemic that specific environment can predispose people to transfer of infections to be on a cruise ship to be in a crowded area such as public transit or shopping center, big gatherings such as concert or uh, sport arenas, festivals, conferences. Through the world we learned that this unfortunately demonstrated again and again that when people coming together in the crowded areas, 
they will be infected and then possibility of spread around the world or around specific region is significant. And as you know, this is, was one of the biggest direction of future prevention of spread of coronavirus. Every country accepted rules to stop big gathering of the people, to close beaches, to close the sport arenas, and so on and so on. And this is definitely respond well, as you know, probably that we were able to achieve what we're looking for, flattening the curve, the incidence of newly infected people, the incidence of people who died from this virus with implementation of these measures were ve worked very well in areas where these specific guidelines were implemented very promptly. This is information you can find from the government of Canada. There are increased risk of individuals who are at 65 with compromised immune system and with underlying medical conditions. But what even more interesting, what we learn from the small amount of times that we have coronavirus uh, in reality, from clinical data that coming from publication. This publication came just on April 20th. Meta-analysis, it is a, one of the latest, most modern way to analyze the clinical data and then make decision for the various clinical intervention and clinical directions. And this sophisticated analysis based on analysis of more than 5,000 cases of COVID virus infections around the world, clearly demonstrated that individuals with hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or respiratory dysfunctions, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease are predominantly at risk for developing of significant illness if they become infected with COVID virus 19. And I showed you three latest largest publications from China, as well from United States, that showed that these are predominantly individuals who have these chronic conditions. We expecting that they could develop a significant uh, complications to, if they become COVID positive. Okay, that's a, this is what we know from the general population. But what we do know about people with spinal cord injury, and I put just a few questions what I would like to answer to you. And many of you already asked this question. Am I really at risk as a person with spinal cord injury to COVID-19 infection? Should I be tested? And what do I need if I need medical help? So, so first of all, what we do know from the people with spinal cord injury. I saw the list of participants and I know that many of my patients participate in this uh, webinar. Yes, we do know very well that unfortunately spinal cord injury predisposed people with spinal cord injury to various chronic conditions, including respiratory dysfunctions, cardiovascular dysfunctions, and diabetes. And this is obviously echoing the same situation in general population. People with any chronic conditions will be predisposed to COVID virus. There is a very important aspect to recognize that immune system is suppressed in people with spinal cord injury. We're not talking about full-blown immune deficiency syndromes that we typically see in the patients with HIV or AIDS. Spinal cord injury will affect innervation of immune system organs, which include spleen, bone marrow, uh, liver, all these organs which produce either specific cells which are responsible for immunity or specific proteins which are responsible for immunity will be affected unfortunately by spinal cord injury. And obviously here we have to keep in mind 
the higher level of injury, the more predisposed person with spinal injury to this immunosuppression. And finally, obviously, people with spinal injury, particularly who are required a care, will be required contact with other people. We cannot totally isolate individuals with high cervical spinal injury who is 24 hours dependent on contact with caregivers. And that's why this is another factor if many individuals without disability can safely isolate themselves at home and stay with safe in home environment, many individuals with spinal injury will require contact with caregivers or with individuals who are coming to their home with potentially be positive with the COVID virus. And there are a few publications that showed this issue that there is a heightened risk for individuals with people with spinal injury uh, for the infection to COVID virus. But however, I will show you some data what at least so far published in the literature with real uh, COVID infections for people with spinal injury. Should you get tested? I will ask, first of all, I will recommend you to go to our BC Center for Disease Control website and you see logo on the bottom. There are very good guidelines. What are the guidelines right now for testing for COVID virus in the British Columbia? There are some provincial differences, but in general, there is a still recommendation that testing recommended only in people who have symptoms. Due to still lack of testing abilities, we do not test 100% of population of British Columbians or 100% population of Canada. That's why at the present time, you see a list of the symptoms that if you develop them, few of them or multiple of them or single of them could require your referral for testing for COVID virus. However, as many of you know that fevers and chills, many of my patients will experience not only due to COVID virus, it could be a result of urinary tract infection, it could result of uh, autonomic dysreflexia with the chills and shivering. And that's why it is a very challenging for a medical community who do not know people with spinal injury, then to distinguish which one symptoms related to COVID or not related to COVID. But again, in general, it is accepted that presence of cough and worsening of respiratory function is a one of the most common and crucial symptoms that have to be present. Again, probably you heard again and again from various sources that COVID-19 symptoms could vary dramatically between the people. Some people will only report loss of smell. More and more we're learning right now is that people will develop kidney complications. That's why again, this bug, we still don't know fully its symptomatology and how he presents uh, in various people. We only basing still this symptomatology on a large number of able-bodied individuals. There is no specific description how COVID-19 can present in person with spinal injury. Uh, again, if you concern that you have possibly symptoms of COVID-19, you can go on the BC uh, website, BC Health at the C, uh, Center for Disease Control, and there is a self-assessment tool that you can complete, and based on the results of this tool, you could make decision should I address my concern to my family physician or to medical practitioner or go to emergency room because I do have 
symptoms that qualified me for the coronavirus 19. Finally, in this portion of my talk, I would like to share with you this diagram prepared by SCIU, SCIU University. This is a group, as you know, uh, individuals with spinal cord injury in Ontario. They developed this nice preventative for COVID-19 guidelines for people with spinal cord injury. It is available uh, on the website. And there are a few symbols, looks like obvious, but sometimes not so obvious for us individuals, directions, how individual with spinal cord injury should prevent himself or herself from possible interaction with outside world, clinic, obviously, personal hygiene, hands, uh, interacting with caregivers, uh, taking care and responsibilities for the manual wheelchair or power wheelchair and so on. So, so this diagram is a very, very useful in my opinion. And in the next few slides, I would like to address in more details questions that were already sent to my attention that will help to cover some big aspects of interactions with respect of COVID. So, so this, I subdivided questions that I received in a few major categories. And you will see on the top of the slide, the main category and then specific questions from individuals from BC who ask them. So, so this section will cover is individuals with spinal cord CI who acquired COVID, what we do know. As I mentioned to you, there is a very little data published yet in people with spinal cord injury. This is my search of the big medical database, which known as a PubMed. It is a peer-reviewed, highly uh, qualified papers published on this website. To date, today in the morning, my search found only five manuscripts some of them only case reports that address specific issues or at least touch some issues of people with spinal cord injury and COVID-19 infection. So far, there is only one case reported. This case was came out on publication on April 17th. It's only 10 days ago. And this is case from Italy, from Firenze, from Florence. And what is unique about this case, they describe the case of individuals, as you can see, with motor sensory complete spinal cord injury, cervical tetraplegia. And what is unique is that this person presents, obviously, what I described to you, with quite different symptoms that were typically known presentation in people without disability. This person did not develop cough. And we talk with you that cough is one of the most prominent symptoms that required testing at the present time all around the world. That's why this is a, one of the things which is a obvious information for us as a medical community that we have to be aware about variety presentation of COVID. 19 infection, and there is a will be differences how individuals with spinal cord injury present. Unfortunately, I cannot give you any additional information what is known because there is nothing is known. For last two months, I am continuing with my clinics. I do my telephone and virtual Zoom conference clinics with my patients. I saw about 60 patients in the last two months. None of my patients so far reported to me that they had symptoms or they were diagnosed with COVID-19, at least in a BC. So this is some kind of good news. Next portion. There were a few questions sent to me about spinal cord injury immune system. One of the questions was, as a quadriplegic, should I keep
keep my children out of the school longer than others until wide application of vaccine will be available. There was a question about, am I really immune compromised if person with spinal cord injury? It does level of injury affect, or person ask, what about low level of injury? As I mentioned you just previously, we do know that immune system is impacted by spinal cord injury. Higher level of cervical spinal cord injury, people will have more predisposition to some immune insufficiency. But again, even immune response in the literature with spinal cord injury is only lately was discovered this issue. That's why again, we don't know fully uh, issues related to significance of impact of immune insufficiency. I only can say that it is not the same as the immune deficiency syndrome. There is a predisposition for immune suppression that we expecting could predispose people with spinal cord injury to other infections. What are the other susceptibility of individuals with spinal cord injury? That's why persons are asking how much more careful should a tetraplegic be regarding exposure to friends, family members, than an able-bodied individuals. And another question who I believe I know who it is. I have recently laid off my caregiver. I did it in March when everyone was coming to pick. My husband has got off laid off work. My caregiver only walks with me to drive the car does not take transit, but she also lives with her live-in boyfriend who I can account for. I'm C4, C5 quadriplegic with difficulties in lung issues, low lung capacity due to my injury. How safe it is for me to allow her back to work? So as these issues, as we mentioned, I know that my patients will require support either from family members or from caregivers. At the present time, recommendations are following that if somebody coming to your home, you and caregiver have to wear personal protective equipment. This will help not only for you not to be infected by droplets or by some spread of coronavirus that person brought from the community, but also person from communities that he or she have to wear gloves, have to wear mask, do not bring these droplets to your environment. But we don't have, unfortunately, capacities right now to test every single person who coming to individuals with spinal cord injury, are they COVID-19 positive or not? That's a protection, protection, protection. At home, if person come and clinic your home, try to do social distancing. That's why if they clinic bathroom or bedroom, you have to be in your living room and then vice versa. That's why again, try to practice social distancing and protect yourself wearing mask and request your caregivers will do the same. Numerous individuals ask if a medical care required during this time, or I really feel that I need to go to emergency room, should I do it? During the last months, I had a patient who has to be admitted to the hospital because of severe autonomic dysreflexia. It's emergency, and we did it. I had patients who I sent to emergency room with possible fracture, and it's again, it's emergency. That's why for all these questions which are listed on this slide, I can tell you that emergency room are still functioning, not only for COVID-19 infected individuals. We still can become sick, and there are four hospitals are there, emergency rooms are there to help you if you need to address acute illness. However, obviously, I will 
ask you all if you're planning to go to emergency or to the hospital, again, wear personal protective equipment. You have to come with mask, you have to come with gloves. This will prevent you from possible contaminations. And then obviously in emergency room, medical personnel will adhere to the same services uh, requirements in order to prevent infections. There were a few questions about different procedures or investigations. Many surgeries that are not life-threatening, I had, for example, one of my patients postponed carpal tunnel syndrome surgery, were canceled. They are not canceled, they are delayed. MRI investigation, and I talked with one of my patients that your MRI will rescheduled. It's not canceled. At the present time, again, idea do not bring you into the hospital and expose to unnecessary contact with more people if it's not needed right now. However, if condition will require admission, will require investigation, it is still available for everybody, for every single person in British Columbia. Again, this is specific questions about visits to emergency room. You cannot wait if you feel that you need emergency room admission. Pain management from home. As I mentioned to you, I still do run full clinics with a telephone consult to my patients. And this is done by also other physiatrists at the GF Strong and at the Blossom Pavilion. That so you still have access to physiatrists with questions related to your pain management, to urinary tract infection management, to any issues that you do not hesitate to call secretaries and book appointment, virtual appointment, over the phone, over the Zoom. You cannot wait. And this is the reality how I will do clinics if I have to see patient. And just recently I have to inject individuals with botulinum toxin because his plasticity becomes so bad that it was dangerous for him to continue to manip manipulate his wheelchair. I brought him to the hospital. I wore protective equipment. My patient wore protective equipment and injections were conducted. What we made decision with my colleagues at the rehabilitation center in Jeff Stroke and Blossom Pavilion as to protect both you and ourselves. Uh, caregiver support and safety during pandemics. We slightly address this and so on. Again, this is the issues. Uh, one of the questions, can I do without help, weighting the risk versus benefits? It is obviously your personal decision. If you feel that bathroom clinic can wait another week or two weeks, it's a one issue. But you cannot wait for the issues related to transferring to your, from wheelchair to the bed or changing bed sheets or need something that definitely you require support from another person. That's why you still will need maintain contact with your caregivers, but again, implement these rules about both you and caregivers have to wear protective equipment. Floors, yes, again, do you need floor keep uh, clean every day, every other day? This is a probably will be low priority, but personal care, you still, many of my patients will rely on support from caregivers and we cannot give up. Health maintenance and prevention. There was a lot of interesting questions which in general important for general health of people with spinal cord injury. There are many questions were about can I improve my immune system? How I can be healthy? Oh, sorry, I will go up. That's so one of the things which I can tell you that at the present time, there is no evidence that any vitamins, any food, 
or exercise will boost your immune system. However, to maintain a healthy lifestyle, eat healthy, exercise regularly, will maintain your general health. And therefore, we don't have, unfortunately, a magic bullet to keep up our immune system against any infections that we have. Try exercise at home, try to eat healthy, because again, eating, eating pattern, meal intakes in people with spinal cord injury, many of you know very well, it's not only for general health, it's a big issue with respect of bowel management. And if bowel unhappy, I know my patients unhappy. This is, this is all connected in body of my patients. Few questions were where I find reliable information. It's a very important question in this challenging time. If you open Google, there is so much good information, but there is also a huge amount of misinformation, confusing information. That's why my recommendation to you, stay with the governmental leading agencies in Canada, such as uh, British Columbia Center Disease Control, our provincial health website, Health Canada website, each of them have section on COVID-19 or coronavirus disease. And there are multiple, multiple good information about testing, symptoms, and so on. That's why at the end of my talk, I would like to leave you with few home, take home messages, and then we can go back to questions. So, so first of all, don't try to change anything in your management. Continue to take medications. Do not change any treatments plans that were already established between your family physician and your physiatrist. As I mentioned to you, you always can contact physiatrist or family physicians. I know also doing phone consults to obtain drug refills and it can be easily done over the phone without going to the clinics. Obviously, talk with your family physician about possibility for needs of vaccination. We talk a little bit about respiratory distress. We do know that respiratory dysfunctions present with many people with high mid thoracic and high cervical level of injury. Majority of you, when you were discharged from the acute rehabilitation, already received pneumococcal vaccination. And this vaccination prevents individuals from pneumococcal pneumonia. Virus itself, initially when it's affected, it will change lung tissue and predispose for developing of full-blown pneumonia, which can be activated by various bacteria, including pneumococcal. That's why preventative uh, injection vaccination for influenza or pneumococcal vaccination is very crucial. Do not delay issues needed to be addressed to emergency room, as I mentioned to you. Ask for help, uh, call 911 and address this issue to the emergency room as you feel needed. So, so this is what all I prepared for my talk today to you and I'm happy to ask, to answer questions if you have any. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. K. Um, can you hit the stop share button on top so then we can see your beautiful face? There yes. we go, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we will open it up to questions. If you have questions, you can um, raise your hand uh, and Jocelyn will, um, will unmute you. But the first thing, I, I kind of missed what you said, Dr. K, um, about the children. So if you're a person with spinal cord injury and have children and school reopens without having a vaccine, what are your thoughts about that? It's a very challenging question. That's why, as you know, we do not know actually if after we even contracted COVID-19, and survive and recover, 
if our immune system develop immunity immune for the next COVID infection. There is some controversial data at the present time in the literature. Some suggest that, yes, we did develop antibody, or people did develop antibody against COVID-19 virus, but unfortunately, they're not protective for second possibility of developing. That's so again, this question we have to address probably to infectious disease people. As you know, I'm not infectious disease person and we need more time to definitely understand how this will continue in the future. Yeah, hopefully we can get a session with an infectious disease yeah. person. That's we'll our goal. So, uh, so Barry, you're up. Hang on one second. Hang and on, Barry, Barry where'd you go? You might have to select unmute yourself when Joe oh, no, I found him. Sorry, Barry, go ahead. I'm up first. I don't remember my question. It's in the chat. Hang on, I'll, I'll go up and look for it. Oh, I answered. Your question was on the top. I actually, I believe I answered your question. Oh, you did, yes. No, I, my additional question was if there was a vaccine that's found or developed, are people with SEI at the top of the list for What's receiving the, the vaccination? Yeah, that's why, so far as we know from the news and from the communication with medical specialists around the world, there are few centers which are working hard on developing vaccine to different components of COVID virus. There is already clinical trials ongoing on, but there is no vaccine yet available for general population. Not yet. All right. Um, Just next is going to be Jessica. Hang on. Sorry, Jessica. Hang on. Uh, unmute. There you go. Go for it, Jessica. Hi. Um, my my boyfriend's a delivery driver, and um, I was just wondering, like, is it safe for him to be working? That's uh, he's still working at the present time. Yeah. Yes. That's just just my... with my disability. Mm -hmm. That's uh, again every single person who coming in contact with other individuals, as you see probably at the stores, uh, many FedEx delivery drivers, many other delivery people will come to the contact with people in gloves and personal protective equipment. And if they continue then come back home, change their clothes before entering maybe home, take a shower. And then this is how medical professionals coming home. Okay. My nephew, my nephew right now, medical resident, his mom is 60. I'm worried about them, but he's coming from the COVID uh, department home, taking shower, taking protections, it's a reality. That's why life will be different and that's why we just have to definitely be extra precautious with the cleaning, protection devices and so on. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to mm -hmm. double check. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Brandy C, you're up next. Do I unmute? Yeah, I unmuted you. Okay, hi. Um, I, I did already have my question partially answered with regards to my caregiver that I laid off in March. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, like my, um, my husband is now doing all of my care. Um, how much longer should we be doing this? Like it's obviously having a major effect on, you know, everything in my life. I'm a mother. He's my husband. Like I don't really want that moving forward for months and months and months, but is it worth it for me to have my caregiver come back? And what sort of PPE should she be wearing? Should it be like what you had on in that picture, uh, talking full face, and or is it something I should just reevaluate in a few months? And then, of course, with the numbers going down in BC, is there a chance that I can maybe let my guard down a tiny bit now because I'm prone to pneumonia, but only up until about now. Like I don't get it in the summer, really. So I mean, I don't. 
you know, I don't know if this acts like other influenzas, if I could be okay to have her come back or if I should just, I know you can't answer if I should say yes or no to this. No, 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 no. That's a no. That's a first of all with the protective equipment. You have to wear only goggles if you're walking with person who is coughing and sneezing in your face. If person is asymptomatic and there is no cough, no distribution of these particles, mask for you and for caregiver and gloves is sufficient. Okay. And then how long it will be? It's again, it's question to our infectious disease and control people who will tell us when they will recommend to open communications, open the work environment, open restaurants. As you know, so far, we to the end of March or maybe middle of May, we will still be on quarantine and self-isolation precautions. You know that our neighbors on South doing slightly differently, and you probably see the CNN and how controversial it is opening some states and not opening other states. And this is unfortunately, many of this opening is not truly medically related issues. There is a lot of politics going on. I believe we live in a slightly different country and I believe we are more coherent among the different provinces and governmental directions until we have a clear decline in uh, new cases and death, we still need precautions. Thank you. Um, Rich had a question also. Rich? Mm -hmm. uh, hang on. Uh, Rich. There you go. Uh, it's actually me, Terry, Marnie. Oh, Marn. Hey, Marn. I was just wondering if people who smoke or vape are more likely to catch it, and if they do catch it, are they more likely to die? <laughs> uh, good questions. I believe, again, if you smoke single, in a, not sharing, uh, joint or not sharing cigarette with other people who potentially COVID, you by yourself, probably there is a very low risk of possibility to to catch COVID. But if you're sharing, like I saw just recently, it was so funny. There were a group of five people in our garden at the Jeff Strong Hospital and one of the patients, obviously, they were two, three meters apart. And then one gentleman ran between all of them and he brought the same joint to all of them. That is a shared joint when they maintained the Distance. It's not working. It's not working. That's a market. I don't. We don't have data about this, but only. It's again. It's a self-isolation and precautions from droplets from another people. Nice. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Olivia. Oh, hang on. Sorry, Olivia. Sorry. Go for it, Olivia. Hi. I'm just wondering whether um, there's any transmission uh, through blood at all, just because like mosquito season is kind of coming into play. So um, I'm just wondering whether that's, that could be like a transmitted factor. Yeah. That's, uh, so far, it's because this question was addressed previously. So far, we know that primary way of transmission is a droplet through the respiratory. Septicemia from the virus is not reported. It's antibody what we typically see in the bloodstream. That's why it is not believed that you can do it through the transmission through the uh, mosquitoes. It's not like malaria. You can get it because by malaria microorganism is live and living and surviving in our blood and then can be transmitted through the mosquitoes. Looks like not for the virus. Okay, and I have another question as well. I, I guess it's like there's been like a lot of like uh, research being done about whether we building the antibodies and whether the antibodies are gonna be like um, covering us. Um, I guess like moving forward, like, um, can, like I guess like we, they would have to take our blood and then like look whether we built the antibodies or whether we had the virus 
um, how would this be different than getting the vaccination? Like, would the vaccination be stronger than just having the antibodies yeah. because we've had the virus? Yeah. That's why, uh, as you know, for example, from influenza vaccine, every year we're vaccinating for strains which were prominent last year. Influenza mm -hmm. virus is so changeable. And that's why every year we have a different pattern of vaccine, which was predominantly present based on the previous year capacity of the virus. We don't know anything yet about the coronavirus, how changing, how quickly it will change, will it maintain and so on. That's why I cannot answer this question right now yeah. because we don't have data, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. it's, For sure. Yeah. It's need time. It's need time. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pleasure. Olivia. Uh, John is up next. Uh, hang on, unmute. There we go. Uh, Dr. K, thanks so much for doing this session. It's awesome. Pleasure. Uh, Pleasure. Um, one quick thing, I think um, that case study you talked about from Italy, I think that's very, very interesting. Um, and again, I think one point you, you forgot to mention was that that individual did recover. Um, C4 AISA complete injury. Um, and yeah, the, pre the symptom presentation was completely abnormal to what most people expect to see from COVID. No cough, none of that. Um, so yeah, definitely be hyper aware and hyper vigilant. But yeah, it's good news to know that even with an injury that high, he did recover. Um, and the second question I have is around, like, you know, we're talking about flattening the curve. If there is a surge, you know, they talk about a, a second surge or a second wave, and it starts to overwhelm the medical system. Is there, you know, a triage protocol for, you know, if the medical resources are stressed, you know, you know, obviously, if there's an emergency situation, the you know, medical triaging dictates that you save those that are most likely to recover first would people with spinal cord injuries be considered lower chance of recovery and would we receive the same optimal care that a non-spinal cord injured person would? Yeah, John, it's a very good and very difficult question. At the present time, I can tell you that in the British Columbia, we are not stressed with respect of access to emergency room, access to intensive care, and access to the respirators. There is a plenty of room to go. I hope we will not need it. But these questions were raised again and again by situation in Italy and situation in Spain, where there was overwhelming influx of individuals with COVID that required ICU admission and prolonged ventilation. There is a huge debate came out from ethicists, medical ethicists. At the present time, there is no discrimination. Any person with disability is treated the same way as any able-bodied individuals. There is only fa compounding factor will dictate medical condition of the individual. This is a what will be taken in account by physician and by group of physicians who make decision what to do next. But it's a very challenging question to ask. And I'm, I'm, we are blessed that we live in British Columbia that these issues so will not be a problem. And we are already going down. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Patty next. Hang on, Patty. Um, there you go. Patty, you had a question in the comments about uh, antibodies, I think. Yes, is there an antibody test yet? And would we as spinal cord injured people be up more up on the list to do one for? Yeah. I, unfortunately, Patty, I cannot answer this. First of all, it is still not widely available to everybody. And when we will have amount of sufficient antibody test, I don't know. That's why this is a, a question to our health authorities and big guys in the government. Right, okay, thank you. Pleasure. So, 
Thank you. Two more questions. Uh, we'll go to Gordon. Yes, Dr. K. Um, Hello. Um, I he had MRSA. Does that make me more susceptible to contracting COVID? Um, good question. We do know that actually in community, many people with MRSA working among us, and as you know, we don't put any labels that you MRSA in community. MRSA only coming to the place when you or anybody will come to the hospital and present rules that we will screen everybody admitted to GF Strong or to hospital. And if person is still MRSA positive, there is a will be precaution in order not to spread inside of the hospital MRSA. Mm -hmm. MRSA infection can affect everything. It could be lungs, could be blood, could be skin. That's why only if it was MRSA positive pneumonia, possibilities that then there is a more uh, high risk for individual who had pneumonia previously and respiratory related issues to MRSA for the COVID virus complications. Yeah, but if you, had, if you had COVID virus skin infection, there is no impact on the respiratory dysfunctions. Yeah, I got MRSA from pneumonia. Yeah, yeah. That's why any individuals who has respiratory distress, unfortunately, you will be a possible candidate for susceptibility and then significant effect. Okay. Thank hopefully you. not. Hopefully not. Stay away. Well, we're we're isolated here, so good. I have no contact with the outside world other than caregivers. So good. Good. Yeah. Glad to hear. Good. Uh, all right, last question from Marnie S. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I haven't left the house in a long time and I should probably get to a lab to bring in like a sample. Now I would have to have like gloves and a mask and then like do I have to wash my clothes when I get back or my chair down? Uh, I believe, do you have caregiver? No, just Jeff and I here. Do you have somebody, family member? Um, not in the house, no. Uh, neighbor, good neighbor. That's why you can give a sample and somebody can drop in the laboratory. Then you are avoiding necessity to go to the lab. But oh, otherwise, yeah. That's a if good idea. you don't have this capacity, then yes, you have to wear gloves and have to wear a mask. Okay. Amazing. Well, Perfect. right on time. Look at that, 601. <laughs> uh, actually, Terry, I have a question. We have a gr big group of people with spinal injury on the line. I see right now 57 individuals, not all of them people with spinal injury. Can somebody say, did anybody develop symptoms of COVID from this group? Send yes. Send yes. Yeah, you can, if you have them then you can type them into the chat box or or, or somebody was you. tested positive nope um okay. everyone you can if you have any questions and we don't have time for them you can uh, email us at info at sci-bc.ca and we'll collect them all and uh, see if we can uh, get dr case help to answer them down the line or see if the presentation already answered them and connect you with the information. Kirsten did, say, Kirsten did say that she was tested, but it was negative. So. Negative, yep. Yeah, I know this. That's why I would like to say thank you, BCSCI again. Thank you guys putting all this together. It was pleasure to collaborate with Chris McBride on application to Craig Nielsen, and I'm truly hopeful that we do good for our community with this small amount of donation from the Craig Nielsen Foundation. Again and again, I'm happy to talk with you guys in my clinic. Anybody physiatrist who is still doing clinics, happy to talk. Why don't you remind us what a physiatrist is again, Dr. K, <laughs> for those who don't know? A physiatrist, you know? it is a physician of physical medicine and rehabilitation, a specialty like me, 
who dealing with people with spine foot injury, stroke, rehabilitation specialist. This is another term, not psychiatrist, but physiatrist. That's a practically all physician at GF Strong Hospital, with the exception of you, uh, internal medicine people are physiatrists. Thank you for that reminder. So if you do not have one, make sure you connect with one, very important. Uh, again, Dr. K, thank you so much. Very grateful to have you here. Thanks, Joss and Jenna for helping out. And uh, hopefully next week we'll see you for our next session. Um, you'll be able to catch what's happening on our next newsletter that's going out. Uh, also reminder to do the survey when you see it. And uh, thank you everyone and a big thank you to the uh, Craig H. Nielsen Foundation as well for sponsoring this for us. So th thank you. Goodbye everybody. Bye. Stay healthy everybody. Bye-bye.